The Alps, Europe's majestic wonderland, and deep inside is one of the world's longest tunnels. Every day it carries thousands of motorists in safety until an ordinary truck explodes into flames. The tunnel turns into a terrifying death trap in just 14 minutes. Now with cutting edge computer technology, we reveal exactly what went wrong. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the fateful decisions in those final seconds from disaster. Europe, France, Mont Blanc, March 24th, 1999, 10.30 a.m. The world's deepest tunnel, cut through solid rock, lies a mile and a half beneath Mont Blanc, Europe's highest mountain. It is a vital link between France and Italy, and truck drivers like it because it shortens their journey from seven hours to a mere 15 minutes. It also saves a climb through winding mountain roads. More than 5,000 vehicles use the tunnel every day, including tourists and locals. It's a fine spring morning as British trucker John Whitby heads for the toll on the Italian side. As you come up through the mountains towards the uh, tunnel entrance, it's very picturesque, and then you see a little black hole in the side of the mountain. Prior to this particular day, I'd always been quite happy to go through the tunnels. Some use the tunnel for pleasure. Extreme skier Nicholas Borghi is heading from his home in Italy to the ski slopes of France. That day, the snow conditions were perfect. It is my passion to ski off piste. We packed our ski boots and all our other gear in the car, drove towards the tunnel. When we got there, we paid our tolls and entered the tunnel as we'd done a thousand times before. Normally, it takes Borghi 15 minutes to drive through the tunnel. Today's journey will be different. Surely it's always dangerous to cross a tunnel, but nothing had ever happened before. And we wish you a pleasant trip. As Borghi and Whitby drive through the tunnel from Italy to France, two independent control rooms monitor their progress, one on the Italian side and one on the French side. Until now, it's just another day in the tunnel. A tunnel that has carried more than 45 million vehicles since it opened in 1965. A remarkable feat of engineering, it took four years to blast through the solid rock of the Alps to create one of the longest tunnels in the world and one of the safest. 18 fire shelters are spaced every third of a mile throughout the tunnel. There are 77 emergency telephones with a dedicated rescue team at the French end and volunteer rescuers at the Italian end. Until March 24th, 1999, it's free of major incidents as the teams have extinguished all previous truck fires without major casualties. But this is about to change. Ten forty-six a.m. A forty-ton refrigerated truck arrives at the toll booth on the French side of the tunnel. One of the two thousand that use the tunnel every day. Behind the wheel is Gilbert de Grave, a fifty-seven-year-old Belgian driver with twenty-five years' experience. Ten forty-seven. He enters the tunnel and reaches thirty-seven miles per hour.
His refrigerated rig is carrying an everyday load, nine tons of margarine, and 12 tons of flour destined for a food factory in Milan. Other trucks and cars enter the tunnel behind him. And as always, 40 closed circuit TV cameras monitor the progress of all vehicles. 10.49. De Graaf's truck has been in the tunnel for two minutes, but neither he nor the closed circuit TV cameras pick up the first signs of trouble. White smoke is escaping from behind his cab. De Graaf's truck is now a mile and a half underground and over a mile into the tunnel. Unaware of the smoke, he continues his journey. 10.50. The smoke increases. De Graaf is nearing the middle of the tunnel. Nine sensors run the length of the tunnel, feeding visibility information to the control rooms at both ends. When visibility is reduced by 30%, it triggers an alarm. But the smoke billowing from de Graaf's truck isn't that dense yet. At last, de Graaf notices. I looked at my side mirrors. I saw some smoke at the right side, but not much. So I drove on normally. 10.51. De Grave is more than three miles into the French side, and the situation is now far from normal. Oncoming cars and trucks can clearly see smoke from behind the cab. It passes under the trailer and swirls up toward the roof of the tunnel. Other drivers realize that something is wrong, and they try to get De Grave's attention. 10.52. Now the smoke is dense enough to trigger the tunnel sensors. They raise an alarm in the French control room, but not the Italian one. Due to a false alarm, it was turned off the previous day. False alarms are not uncommon. At this stage, only the French tunnel operator hears the alarm, but doesn't know its cause. Meanwhile, the entrance tolls to the tunnel remain open and vehicles continue to enter from both ends. Finally, Gilbert de Grove can no longer ignore the smoke. As I drive, the smoke is increasing. I put on my hazard lights to warn the people behind and avoid an accident. 10.53. He brings his truck to a halt. He is more than three and a half miles in, the halfway point of the Mont Blanc tunnel. I stopped slowly. I got out of the truck and the smoke was much more noticeable. A line quickly forms behind him. I tried to grab hold of the extinguisher, but I didn't have time because the whole cabin was in flames. Suddenly, it explodes. De Grave abandons his truck and runs towards Italy. Driving towards him on the other side of the road is Nicholas Borghi. I was halfway through the tunnel when I saw a glow far away. Then when I was 20 meters away, I saw a massive flame and the truck driver running away. The line behind de Graaf's truck is growing. 38 men and women are stuck in their vehicles, and none of them can see the danger ahead. But John Whitby, who is coming from the opposite direction, can. We looked down the tunnel and couldn't see anything but blackness. But what we didn't know at that point was that, that blackness was actually thick smoke. and that thick smoke is rapidly enveloping the vehicles stuck behind de Graaf's truck. Within seconds, the road tunnel could turn into a raging inferno. Seconds from disaster will continue in a moment. We now return to seconds from disaster. A 
A truck traveling from France to Italy in the Mont Blanc tunnel stops and bursts into flames. A line of vehicles comes to a halt behind it. Alarms trigger in the tunnel's control rooms, but operators don't realize the seriousness of the situation. They continue to allow vehicles to enter the tunnel from its two entrances in France and Italy. 1054. The truck has been on fire for one minute. Someone in the tunnel sees the smoke and uses the emergency phone at Shelter 22, almost a thousand feet from the truck. It rings through to the Italian control room. The operator gets his first direct information that there is a serious problem. Immediately, the Italian and French controllers contact each other. Now they can clearly see the smoke on their monitors. But they can't see the truck. It's engulfed by the smoke. Realizing the danger, they close the tunnel to new vehicles at both ends. But for the 25 vehicles and 38 people who have already followed de Graaf's truck into the tunnel, it's too late. They're either driving towards the truck or they're stuck behind it. Ten fifty-six. By now, thick black smoke is moving over the first of the trapped vehicles behind the truck towards France. But ahead of the flaming truck towards Italy, the smoke is spreading more slowly. One of the drivers coming from that direction is Nicolas Borghi. I myself and the cars behind me were able to reverse till we reached a lay-by where we could do a U-turn and head towards the exit. In the Italian control room, an operator sees the fleeing vehicles and pumps in fresh air. But this increased airflow moves through the tunnel towards the fire and France. When air hits fire, it creates a problem. Like Borghi, John Whitby is also trying to escape. He stops a thousand feet from the inferno. But the tunnel is too narrow for his truck to turn. He has no choice but to abandon it. As he does, he looks back on the trapped vehicles. There must have been a lot of people that just did not stand a, a chance at all. Uh, it must have been absolutely horrifying for them. As Whitby makes his escape, the fire is burning fiercely, producing more and more thick black smoke. 1057. The fire has been raging for just four minutes, yet the killer smoke has already traveled a third of a mile towards France. The alarm reaches the tunnel's rescue team stationed at the French entrance and a four-man team prepares to go in. 1058. The wall of smoke from the epicenter of the fire obscures the view of the closed-circuit TV cameras. And as the French rescue teams enter the tunnel, they don't know that 38 people are stuck in their vehicles behind the truck. For the drivers, the situation is horrific. Visibility is reduced to less than two feet. Panicked, some try to drive away. But the lack of oxygen kills their engines and their only means of escape. In desperation, some try to reach shelters, specially designed fireproof rooms located every third of a mile, but their quest is futile. It's a living nightmare.
most of those trapped are unconscious within minutes. It's now 11 o'clock. As the scale of the catastrophe grows, firefighters from the French town of Chamonix scramble to enter the tunnel. But they only travel two and a half miles before their vehicle is swallowed by smoke. Unable to turn around, they are forced to abandon it and seek shelter in a maintenance room where they will remain for five hours. No emergency services manage to reach the center of the blaze. And now, the first rescuers enter from the Italian side, where the smoke is spreading more slowly. John Whitby is still by his truck when he sees them. The wail of sirens came down the tube, and they screamed past us um, down into the darkness ahead. And um, they were sort of swallowed up by the smoke, actually. The Italian volunteer rescuers get within a thousand feet, and one patrolman gets within 30 feet of the truck. But then, a new danger forces them all to turn back. There were six explosions in rapid succession, which were just bang, 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 uh, very quick. And they were very powerful explosions. Tires from the vehicles explode, sending deadly shrapnel flying. shook with the, the force of the explosion. Within a, a minute of minute or two of that happening, the fire brigade were back. As they retreat, the Italians rescue John Whitby and other drivers. Among them is Gilbert de Grave, the driver of the truck that starts the inferno. They exit the tunnel on the Italian side, all making a miraculous escape. 11-11. Italian firefighters enter the tunnel to tackle the blaze. Leading them is fire chief Dionigi Glari. We could see in the distance a wall of smoke that we tried to penetrate with our vehicle. But again, the smoke is too thick, and Glari and his team are forced to retreat. They seek shelter in refuge number 24, one of the tunnel's fireproof rooms. Here they'll be safe for two hours. But for these firefighters, the drama is far from over they receive word that their colleagues are trapped. But where? Bravely, Glari and his team leave the safety of Shelter 24 and venture into the smoke to try to find them. We were walking in the tunnel with one hand along the walls so as to find our way. Reaching the next refuge, we entered, looked around, and found there was no one there. The conditions worsen, and after 10 minutes, the firefighters are forced back to Shelter 24. To their disbelief, the smoke-proof room now offers them little protection. We saw smoke coming from the ventilation vents that should send clean air into the refuge. With their breathing apparatus running on empty, they are desperately short of air. Outside, the operation commander devises a plan. The trapped firefighters are told that beneath the road is a ventilation duct full of fresh air, which may offer a means of escape. The problem is finding the door without getting lost in the smoke. To reach this doorway, we had to use an electrical extension lead that we tied to the door of the refuge and then went to look for the doorway. At the same time, more Italian firefighters are sent in through the ventilation duct to try to open the door from below. The moment they opened that door, 
That was the moment I glimpsed a possibility of escape. The rescuers become the rescued. After three hours, Glari and his team are able to escape through the ventilation duct. But what they don't know is that 38 people are still trapped inside the tunnel with temperatures exceeding 1,000 degrees. Eleven thirty. Thirty-seven minutes after the truck erupts in flames, the dense, deadly smoke now stretches for nearly four miles, filling the tunnel all the way to the French exit. Firefighters abandon all efforts to attack the flames. No one in the tunnel has a chance of survival. The fire is so ferocious, it burns for 53 hours. Only then can firefighters pick their way through the charred debris. They are horrified to discover the remains of the 38 trapped people. These pictures reveal the true extent of the tragedy. Those who survive, like Nicholas Borgi, are astonished at the fire's ferocity. More shocking is that the heat had melted the steel in the lorries. You could only see the basis of the lorries, the skeleton. What could have happened to those poor people left in there? The disaster takes everyone by surprise. How could such a catastrophe occur? How could an ordinary truck carrying an ordinary load of margarine and flour caused one of the worst tunnel disasters on record. From the moment the truck enters the tunnel, it takes just 14 minutes for 38 people to perish. Now, we rewind the events of that fateful day and go deep into the investigation to reveal what really happened. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can, into the heart of the disaster zone. A team of experts is assembled to investigate the fire. Using their data, we can piece together the deadly chain of events to find out what caused this terrible tragedy. The first mystery facing the experts is what starts the fire in the truck. They trace the truck's journey on its approach to the tunnel. This is where problems could first occur. Trucks frequently overheat on the long climb up to the tunnel entrance. Investigators examine the remains of the truck. Is there a fault with the FH-12 engine? After intensive tests, they find no conclusive evidence of overheating. Then, a breakthrough. Investigators find particles inside the engine that could only get there if the air filter had burned before the main fire. But how could the air filter have burned first? One theory is that a casually discarded cigarette from a passing vehicle enters the truck's air filter on top of the cabin. The cigarette travels down the filter, which catches fire. Particles then enter the engine, causing that to catch fire. Then the blaze starts. It's a strong possibility. Investigators then carry out an experiment on a similar truck in similar conditions. Although not conclusive, it proves that a cigarette butt entering the air filter could cause a fire. But that in itself is not enough to cause a tragedy on the scale of the Mont Blanc Tunnel fire. How did this small fire turn into a raging inferno? Stay tuned. More Seconds from Disaster in a moment. And now, back to Seconds from Disaster. 
Deep in the Mont Blanc tunnel, a minor fire suddenly spirals out of control. In 14 minutes, 38 people perish. Using advanced computer graphics based on official reports, we go deep into the investigation to unravel the deadly chain of events. Investigators believe it starts with a small fire smoldering in the engine beneath the cab. 14 minutes from disaster. De Grave enters the tunnel. But the fire only erupts after he stops and abandons his vehicle. Could the movement of air prevent the fire from taking hold? Experts know that truck fires can develop more quickly when vehicles slow down or stop because the supply of oxygen increases, which feeds the fire. Ed Gallia is a fire expert. There was a recent example where a, um, a bus had caught fire in an alpine tunnel, and the bus driver continued driving, managed to get the vehicle through the tunnel um, to the other side, managed to evacuate the vehicle, and then the bus erupted in flames. Maybe if de Grave had continued driving, he could have made it to the end of the tunnel before the fire flared up. But he didn't. Seven minutes from disaster, he stops halfway through the tunnel. Almost immediately, the truck bursts into flames. But why did it spread so quickly? Underneath the refrigerated trailer, just feet from the flames, are the truck's diesel tanks. Investigators know that in previous truck fires, diesel is a contributing factor. Did diesel from de Grave's truck fuel the fire? De Grave's truck is carrying 145 gallons of diesel. His tank is only half full, so it can't be the cause of the rapid spread of fire. Investigators turn their attention to the contents of the refrigerated trailer. It's carrying nine tons of margarine and 12 tons of flour, a seemingly harmless load that's not even classified as dangerous goods. With little else to go on, they began to experiment with the cargo. Here, a simple demonstration shows how one ton of margarine simulates the cargo. It's wrapped in polystyrene sheets, the same insulation material lining the refrigerated trailer. After just two minutes, it proves to be a highly combustible combination. In refrigerated vans, you have polyurethane. And when this burns, it produces a, a lot of heat. It burns, it can burn very rapidly. Now, when the margarine melts due to the fire, it's an oil-based material, and it will also rapidly burn, producing quite a lot of heat. Margarine has a very high energy content. When melted, it's almost as dangerous as gasoline. Our experiment shows how dangerous things can be in the open air. But experts know that in the confines of tunnels, fires burn much more intensely because there are limited outlets for the heat to escape. To find out more, this research facility is conducting large-scale fire tests in an unused tunnel in Norway. Simulated trailers with various loads are set on fire to gauge the heat generated by trucks carrying typical loads like packing crates and furniture. The result is the world's highest heat release rating ever recorded in a tunnel fire test. But is margarine even more flammable? The Mont Blanc team calculates that the burning load of margarine may have rated even higher. The intensity of the fire on March 24, 1999 takes everyone by surprise, including Mont Blanc tunnel expert Jean Martinetti. The fire reached between 1,000 and 1,200 degrees. Nothing could withstand it. Everything melted, the ground, the concrete, the structure. It was completely unthinkable, a real crematorium. Investigators are shocked that a simple cargo of margarine and flour, not classified as dangerous, 
could produce a fire almost as powerful as an 8,000 gallon fuel tanker. But 14 other trucks are stuck in a half mile line behind the first burning truck. Could these have contributed to the fire? The combined firepower of these trucks burning together takes the inferno to an unimaginable level of horror for the 38 trapped people in the tunnel. Uh, the vehicles that were involved in the fire had the energy content um, equivalent of about five to seven petrol tankers full of fuel. But for these vehicles to contribute to the inferno, the fire first had to spread to them. How did that happen? Three explanations emerge. First, the burning truck radiates heat and generates hot gases. In the confines of a tunnel, vehicles a great distance from the fire can ignite. Another way is that uh, the vehicle that's on fire is leaking fuel and it runs along the length of the tunnel. Yet another way is if the fire is very intense, your road surface itself catches fire and then that will ignite the other vehicles in the tunnel. Investigators are not able to prove which of the three methods causes the fire to spread, but they do make another discovery. Fire is not the real killer. We found out later that people died in the cars before they could even open the doors and get out. So if fire isn't the killer, what is? We'll return with more Seconds from Disaster after this. You're watching Seconds from Disaster. A smoldering truck enters the Mont Blanc tunnel. The driver stops and suddenly his truck explodes into flames. Investigators know that the driver manages to escape the inferno by running towards Italy. But 38 motorists behind his truck back towards France perish. Why? Investigators focus on the smoke given off by the fire. Without realizing it, John Whitby is a witness to this deadly wall of smoke. All we could see ahead was blackness about 200 meters from where we were stopped. Um, it was just completely dark. Uh, we presumed that it was just lack of lighting, um, but it actually turned out to be the smoke from the fire. Seven minutes from disaster. Data gathered from sensors in the tunnel revealed that in these minutes, smoke travels half a mile over the 25 gridlocked vehicles. The smoke travels 15 feet per second, nearly 10 miles per hour, creating a sudden loss of visibility down to a foot and a half. The trapped drivers have only seconds to decide whether to try to reach the safety of a shelter or remain in their vehicles. People probably believe that uh, they're safe in their vehicle, that the smoke is not going to be too much of a problem, that the fire will be brought under control and they might as well stay in, the, in their car. Four minutes left. In the middle of the smoke, four cars do attempt to turn around. The tunnel is wide enough, so why don't they make it? Experts know that car engines need oxygen to work. The fire is consuming the oxygen and replacing it with carbon monoxide. Starved of oxygen, the vehicle's engines sputter and die. There's no way out. The fate for those who abandon their vehicles is equally bleak. They are overcome by smoke and other toxic gases before they reach the safe areas. Analysis of the scene reveals that the smoke contains cyanide, a gas that no one can survive. 
The smoke fills the French half of the tunnel so rapidly that none of the 38 trapped people stands a chance. Even the fittest individual couldn't outrun it. Fourteen minutes after the truck enters the tunnel, everyone behind the truck has perished. Investigators now turn their attention to the deadly smoke and why it moves towards France. Normally, air in the tunnel flows the other way, towards Italy. The tunnel operators can dramatically affect the airflow using the tunnel's ventilation system. Gigantic fans in plant rooms at both ends enable the operators to supply or extract air through ducts running beneath the road. Normal operation requires ducts to supply air, but in the event of fire, duct 5 is supposed to be set to remove the smoke. Did operators carry out the correct emergency procedure? Jean Martinetti has studied the official reports and knows the tunnel inside out. He is shocked by what he learns. When the fire occurred on the Italian side, according to the reports, the Italian operator blew fresh air in instead of extracting it. The Italian tunnel operator sees motorists attempting to turn around. To aid their escape, he adjusts the ventilation settings and pumps in fresh air. The disruption of normal airflow plays a major role in the disaster, although the air blown in from Italy undoubtedly saved some lives, including John Whitby's. I realized how lucky I was. 90% um, of the time, the smoke come, would have come the other way to, to Italy, and I wouldn't be here now. But the air being pumped in from Italy moves the smoke towards France at a terrifying speed. After enveloping the vehicles trapped behind the burning truck, the smoke accelerates, now moving at 20 feet per second. On the French side, the whole French half of the tunnel was filled with smoke in little over half an hour. Approaching the fire from either end of the tunnel is impossible. And all rescue attempts are called off. but a startling discovery is about to be made. Stay tuned, the conclusion in a moment. And now the conclusion of seconds from disaster. A fire in the Mont Blanc tunnel between France and Italy becomes one of the worst tunnel fires on record. A critical chain of events causes the disaster. And now, investigators discover the final link. Throughout the entire rescue, none of the emergency teams or tunnel operators is aware of the 38 trapped motorists. The closed circuit TV cameras are so quickly blocked by the smoke that it's impossible for the tunnel operators to see them. Emergency telephones only work intermittently, and sensors that detect smoke aren't adequate. In fact, one is even turned off the day before the fire. Worse still, there is no communication between the French and Italian rescuers. Even firefighters become trapped. It is a totally uncoordinated effort. Tackling a fire of this severity seems to take everyone by surprise. A lack of fire drills might explain why it's more than three hours after the fire begins that the last of the trapped Italian firefighters are brought out through the underground ventilation ducts. They were absolutely black. You couldn't see the color of the helmets or the uniforms. You couldn't see the color of the fire engines. Everything that came out of that tunnel was black. 
Um, it, it was a horrible, horrible sight, really. The inferno rages for 53 hours before it's extinguished. I really hope that something is done to improve the safety of these tunnels. The disaster triggered an overhaul of safety procedures in the Mont Blanc tunnel. Today, maximum speed limits and minimum distances between vehicles are strictly enforced. 17 previous fires in the tunnel were caused by trucks, but now, sophisticated thermal sensors at each entrance scan all trucks to detect dangerous heat emissions before they enter the tunnel. The tunnel operators have gone a long way to correct the mistakes. They stage regular fire and evacuation drills. The shelters are now pressurized and equipped with a video link to the control room. Staircases now connect them directly to evacuation tunnels below the road. There is now a firefighting team permanently based in the center of the tunnel. And fire trucks are equipped with heat-seeking systems so they can locate people in zero visibility. March 24, 1999 provided clues that may save lives in the future, but it's small consolation for relatives of the people who died in the tunnel, including one firefighter who died from his injuries later. Xavier Chantelot will never be the same. I lost my mother-in-law, her daughter, my wife's sister, and also her fiancé. They'd all been staying with us on holiday. For relatives of the victims, like Xavier, there are still many unanswered questions regarding the final moments of loved ones lost inside the tunnel. We still do not know for sure how they died. I'm sure I don't need to describe the horrific images I have in my head. People running about on fire or collapsing, trying to get out. You think of everything. The Mont Blanc Tunnel fire and its critical chain of events reveals the dangers of deep road tunnels. On that day, a large white truck enters the tunnel. A small fire under the cab gives off a stream of white smoke. The truck stops. More air reaches the fire, causing it to erupt. The ordinary cargo of margarine turns deadly, creating a fire with the same potential as an 8,000-gallon fuel tanker. Unusual weather conditions and incorrect use of the tunnel's ventilation system creates a wall of smoke that quickly envelops 38 trapped motorists. They have no chance of survival. But was this critical chain of events unique? I think there will be another fire in the Mont Blanc tunnel. Tomorrow, in six months, a year, but the emergency services are better adapted today than they were at the time of the disaster. But there will be another fire. Is another Mont Blanc disaster possible somewhere in the world? Yes, it is. Um, and it's perhaps only a matter of time. But until it happens, Millions of vehicles will continue to travel through road tunnels every day.
This is the National Geographic Channel.